I always start by uh, reminding myself of why I'm doing what I'm doing. When I was a little kid, um, I was torn between being a, a newspaper person or, or being a politician. Um, and I was working for campaigns when I was a little kid and, and I was always losing, you know, I mean, I was working for McCarthy and McGovern and, and all these people, you know, when I was a child. Um, and um, so I thought, no, that's, that's not going to work. My mom was a newspaper editor and so when I was like, I think, you know, nine or ten years old, I started doing jobs at her newspaper for money, filing mug shots and, and then I graduated to writing brides and obituaries and I was in paste up. So I think probably the newspapering came to me very young. Um, I say, well, and you, you do this and you get to meet interesting people, obviously. <laughs> but I, I never wanted a job where I'd be sitting in, in an office all day. I love meeting people. I, I think photojournalism is this sort of amazing passport you know, to, to go out into the world and, and experience things that, that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, for me, uh, I've been at newspapers now, gosh, I started at the Baltimore Sun in 1980, went to the Philadelphia Inquirer the following year, and I have been there ever since. We did have a, a fabulous Sunday magazine for a long time that really lent itself to, uh, to doing the kind of picture stories that I like the best. So even though I'm going to be showing you guys more documentary stuff and picture stories, like please be aware, I shoot high school football. I shoot business portraits. <laughs> I mean, I, I do all kinds of other things. Um, and, and, and really, for someone like me, uh, the best thing is to be able to get rid of those assignments and, and then you know, find the ones I really love and put more time into those. Um, so anyway, I, I do a lot of stories on, on families. This is a, a single father. It's one of the first stories I did when I went to the Inquirer. Um, I did a story on, on step family marriages in, uh, in 1989. This is probably the biggest selling, most popular picture. I mean, they, they reprinted in textbooks. They made posters out of it. It was in Life magazine. It turns up in books. Um, and and it, it's one of those examples of something that I sat there and I thought, I wonder what this is like. Because at that time, um, I was married still. I'm um, divorced now, but I thought, I wonder what it's like when, when you know, parents get divorced for the children. I wonder if that's something that you can show visually. And um, my editors were like, well, I don't know, but go ahead and try. And, and I, 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 it was amazing the family that I found because the kids reacted to their parents' remarriages. Uh, like it was the funeral of their, of their own parents' marriage, you know? And it's funny, too, because it, it really, so much of it depends on the subjects you pick. After I took these pictures, uh, pictures of this story for the Inquirer, I went on assignment for Life magazine to do a similar, similar story. They, they had me do three families, and none of them were as visual as these guys. And I think one family even like, decided they didn't want the story after all. You know, so I, if you pick your subjects, you know, it, that's, that's a lot of it too. You have to pick them carefully, and they have to be people who are expressive and will, will allow you really good access. So it's not necessarily just about having an idea. It's about, it's about finding the right people to photograph that idea. Um, working at the Inquirer, I got a lot of my ideas from daily assignments. I, I went to an event for families of inmates. And um, a grandmother was sitting there with the grandkids saying, when my daughter gets out, you know, she better get it together. So I followed her family. I followed her daughter getting out. And, and this is a, they got evicted. You know, this girl on the right was the one who was in jail. And, and so you saw all these things that would happen that would maybe cause her to relapse and, and do drugs again. This is from a, a story about um, a, a bone marrow transplant story. But I became fascinated by, by Debbie Ravani because, because she had to go into isolation after her <laughs> transplant and she, she couldn't see her son for, for a period of time. And that was really hard for them. Um, I don't travel a lot. I'm a, I, a single parent. My kids are older now, but now my parents are way older too, so there's so much going on in my life all the time. It's very hard to get away. But I find that the same principles that applied to the stories I was doing at home applied overseas. I, I went to my editor, this is in the 90s when, when people still had money to send, <laughs> send us places in, and I said I want to do something on um, the women being raped in, in Bosnia. I want to go over there. And um, you know, he gave me $5,000 and said, go. 
And, 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 and really, I didn't wind up actually going into the war zone. I wound up showing women refugees on the periphery of things. I mean, and most of the men in, in their family had been killed. I'm going to show you this. This kind of led to uh, one of my uh, recent obsessions with gun violence. Uh, there's just been so much of it. I work, I live um, just outside of Philadelphia. I live about four miles from Camden. And Camden's obviously pretty notorious, poorest, most violent city. And, and Philadelphia, uh, back in 2006 when I did this, they were setting records for homicide. And we followed the woman on the right, uh, Victoria Yancey. She worked for the Philly school system. And her whole job was to sort of um, talk, be, she, she was a liaison between the school system and people who had lost a kid or whose child was very ill, whose kid was hurt. And she was really busy. We followed her for four days. And I think there were maybe that many homicides. There were four, you know, four or five. It was, it was really, it was crazy following Victoria around. Um, this was the only time I've ever seen this done. This is in a classroom. This is on the desk of a kid who was shot and killed in an argument playing video games. He was 14. And, and I, these are the, his favorite things were chess and football. And I've never seen that since. But I, you know, that was actually in the school on his desk. Um, after I did this, I, I got a, a brainstorm because I, I write. I don't just photograph, I write, which was really hard at the papers that I went to because I went to these union newspapers like the Baltimore Sun and the Philadelphia Inquirer where you're only supposed to do one thing, period. So when I wrote, the union would file a grievance. So I was like, whoa, wait a minute. I, I can't do both things? This is you know, really frustrating. So um, in recent years, as things got bad, more of us are allowed to do different things, and the union is just trying to survive. So I, I decided uh, in Philadelphia I wanted to do a column. I would write and photograph a column for every kid that was killed by guns in the area. And it was a difficult thing to sell to the newspaper, uh, because there were editors at the newspaper that said, well, how are you going to show us which kids are guilty and which kids aren't? And that just made me crazy because it, nobody deserves to be shot and killed in the street. You know, I, I, taking this on, it was a commitment that I would meet the family. I would cover every single kid, no matter what, you know, of a certain age. We decided under 18 might be manageable. Once you hit age 18, there would be too many, and, and I would, wouldn't be able to keep up. Because while I was doing this column, I counted. I did 250 other daily assignments that year. So this column was like, you, you know, <laughs> not, the, not, not the only thing I did. So anyway, I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you a few of them. Um, so we would run a mug shot, uh, like a, a little picture of the child who was killed. And, and then I would take a picture to go with each column of something around that child's death, which was hard. It was hard to come up with. We did, I did 24 children. It was hard to come up with, with different pictures. It was hard to write about 24 kids that I would never meet. This is a little girl crying you know, at, at, a, um, at a memorial for, for Kyle, who was shot. And this is what the column looked like. They called it Kids, Guns, and a Deadly Toll. And you know, I don't think that I have um, the images to show you how these were run in the paper, but they were buried deep in the paper. Um, it, was, it was not easy to find them, because newspapers, um, you know, as, as we're doing worse in recent years, are really afraid of depressing readers. You know, they do focus groups, and people say, like, ah, I don't want to see all this violence and crime, and uh, you know. To me, I, I really feel like people just want really interesting stories. I, don't, I think they can handle sad stories. They can handle happy stories. But, um, but this is what the column looked like. And this was Anthony. And you know what I found with the kids, too? These kids were not hardcore. I expected more of these deaths to be drug related. You know, And they really weren't. They were like, ah. there were a bunch of them. There was a three-year-old that got killed, picking up his mom's boyfriend's gun and sticking it in his mouth. I mean, there were a bunch of completely accidental gun deaths. 
there were mostly kids fighting over stupid stuff. You know, there was one where, like, actually, uh, this kid, they, he went to, he thought he was going to have a fist fight with another kid that he was in an argument with, and he went to pull over his, take off his shirt and fight bare chested, and the other kid shot him. So, I mean, it, it was stupid things. There was, I think, one kid who was dealing drugs, and that kid was like a, an A student who was saving the money, you know, for his family and for college. He thought that was sort of a good job thing. And I, I would like do, I would try to follow the family's lead at the funerals. I mean, there were families that were like totally open in terms of, you know, sure, you can, you can show my son in the coffin. This is one of the few pictures that the inquiry's ever run, I think, where you can actually see a recognizable person in a coffin because that's always a subject of great debate at our paper. I don't think they would probably run this right now, but this was in 2006. And like I said, you would try to get other things that maybe weren't at a funeral. It's a little, this is a little girl that was shot and killed in a car. They were aiming at someone else. And I, I learned a lot doing this. It, it was the most amazing experience, really, because I learned a lot about just being a journalist. Um, the kid who was in this coffin, uh, it was very hard to track down. You know, I would go to like local television news websites and try to find the kids, like who was killed, who was killed. I didn't want to miss anyone. And, um, and the police, my police source said, you will never find this kid. You'll never find out about this kid. You will never find his family. Don't even try, give up. And I went to the neighborhood and I'm trying to be a little detective and I'm talking to people. And what happened was he was in a, a little witness protection program in Philly. But in Philly, they just relocate the wit you know, the witness to another neighborhood. And this kid had gone back to his old neighborhood to work at a fast food place. So then that led to me writing a front page story about the witness program in Philly. So I, I really kind of, I just learned so much doing this. Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite, uh, favorite stories. This is, this is something that happened in Camden. I was actually, I think, I was on my computer and I'm reading about things that were going on and I saw that a little boy had been shot um, and blinded by a stray bullet in Camden. I was like, oh my God, I have to do a story on this. Well, it's really hard to get access to those kinds of situ situations because the hospitals are very protective it, you know, of, 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 of children who would be in this situation. I, I called the children's hospital and I said, you know, if I wanted to do a story on this, this kid, is that something you guys would allow? And they said, oh no, we would never let you do that. So I was like, okay. So um, I went over to the hospital, I walked into the lobby, and I said to the, I saw this family, I had a feeling, and I said, are you the family of the little boy who was shot? Who was shot in the eye? And they said, yeah. You know, and, and they took me up to his room. And they let me in, and they let me do a story. And it, it was pretty crazy because basically I snuck pictures at the Children's Hospital in, in Philadelphia. I snuck pictures there for several weeks. You know, they passed me off as a family friend. People looked at, <laughs> people looked at them like, right, like, you know, are you sure she's really part of your family? Are you, you know? But, um, you know, and, and I, I, was, I talked to my editors about it, and basically at newspapers, um, until something is published, there really isn't any liability or problem. So my editors kind of thought, well, okay, go ahead, do what you're doing, and then if we decide to publish it, we'll talk to the people at the hospital and, and, and you know, we'll work it out because we have a good relationship with those, with those people. So anyway, uh, this is George Cartagena. He, uh, he lives with his grandmother who actually um, can't read or write English, and he was the eyes in the family, actually. He was the eyes for her. So that was kind of a huge thing. Um, Hispanic, they live in Camden. And he was just walking, it was about 3.30 in the afternoon, and he was walking to uh, his grandma's house where he lived. And somebody was shooting at someone else, and, and George got in the way. The bullet like went in behind one eye, took out the optic nerve, and actually exited the other eye. So right now, he's got a glass eye, and um, he, he can't see it all. He's totally blind. I don't know if he'll ever regain anything from the one eye. 
I took that uh, in the rehab. I'll show you the picture. So this is in the ICU when I met the family and they took me upstairs and I made a quick picture of him there. That's his grandmother, Manuela. Um, his cousin, Siani. He had just left her house when he was shot, so she felt really guilty. His little sister, Mina, who didn't seem to grasp that, you know, <laughs> that he was fragile. And um, he went from a hospital to a rehab. So I went to my supervisors then, and I said, OK, now he's going to a rehab. What should I do? And they said, well, in the rehab, in order to show him doing anything, you, they're going to have to know. You, they're going to see you. It's not like a hospital where you, know, you can hide the camera under a chair or whatever. So um, OK. So I talked to the rehab. I said, all right, hey, this is what I'm doing. And they were great. They were like, you know, no problem. They signed releases. It's going to be fine. Well, the first day George was there, he was really upset. He was crying. I, I made a really cool video of, of George uh, where he's crying. And he's saying, I'm blind. I can't see. It was very hard in the beginning. you know. So they responded to that by telling me I couldn't come back after the first day, except to visit him without my cameras. In, until they felt that he was better enough, you know, and that was very frustrating. And then they let me in, uh, they let me shoot again right before he was leaving. It's the day he's leaving. And he, he went back to the apartment right near where this happened with no air conditioning on the hottest day of the year. And he's listening to the TV in this picture. Um, first time going back to a playground with his cousins and his aunt. And, and just sort of, you know, getting himself together. But there was a lot of anger. And there were a lot of times George told me, F you, get out of here, April. You know, and then there were other times when he was like, let me use your camera to take a picture. And I said, sure. <laughs> so, you know. But I felt that he had the right to be Curious, really, with what had happened to him. Uh, this is someone teaching him how to walk with a cane, but she didn't realize that this is like the neighborhood where he got shot. You know, so he was really apprehensive. Now, after the story came out, I really expected like great things were going to happen. People were going to see this, and everybody was going to rally. You know on George's behalf and do things for George and you know people would help him and nothing much happened for a while you know and then about six months in um, the chief of police got to know him and became his godfather uh, a, a charity in Camden helped get him a house in a safer neighborhood he started going to um, a church he went to it he went to a special school this is with the chief of police at Sacred Heart Church. They kind of adopted him. This is the chief. Um, this is the new house. He's listening to the doorbell. And this is the last picture of George at the beach. Now, the thing that happened with George, it's kind of a cautionary tale uh, because he's not in Camden anymore. He had all these all these people who meant well doing all kinds of things for him and helping him. And what happened was his grandmother decided that like, it was too much interference, really. And she wasn't able to raise George herself. And they all acted like they were in charge of him. And she took him and left town. And so it's, it's very frustrating. Because I felt like this was a story where like, I had really you know, helped somebody. But we talk on the phone. He, pr he likes to prank call me. <laughs> I, get, I get these calls from George like, eh, like, have you paid your telephone bill? And I'm like, hi, George. You know. <laughs> so anyway. <coughs> but but it, it, you know, it's about, to me, it's about p putting a human face on these problems. And like the same way with the homicide series, that I thought it was good for people to see the names and the faces and, and learn something about all the, the kids that were dying. It makes it, it, makes it harder to, to turn away from the problem. In fact, with the homicide series, I didn't mention this, but um, the guy who's the deputy public safety director in Philly now, he was a, a public defender at the time. He would use my columns and show them to the killers. You know, and say, look, read about this kid. 
that you, you know, that you kill. Anyway, um, Camden. My current obsession with Camden began in January 2011 when they laid off a, a ton of police and firefighters. And the firefighters were just really out there in the street, you know, handing in the badges and crying. Many and most of them actually have been hired back since then, but it, but it, was, really, it was really a tough day. And, and it, it's just a struggle in that city. So many things were closing. The main library closed. This is, I just like this picture because it's the, the last night of this library before it's closed forever. People, poor people who couldn't afford computers were using the internet here to find apartments and jobs. And the guy at left says to the librarian, aren't you going to have donuts or something as a going away party? <laughs> like, no, we're looking for new jobs. Um, animal control uh, unit was disbanded. That's a pit bull. I went out with a, with a woman who was trying to do it by herself as a volunteer. This is the mayor uh, having to deal with you know, families of the, the laid off cops and firefighters. Part of the thing that I love about Camden is that there's all these mentors that are working with kids and really care. And they have the biggest hearts. And you know, they're fighting the tide. And this guy, Chris Williams, started this Camden Boxing Academy in this really bad neighborhood in North Camden. And, um, and, and this is one of his boxers. And I actually wound up following these guys to the Golden Gloves tournament in, in Indianapolis. You know, I mean, but, um, but Chris just pulls kids off of drug corners and says, come on, let's, let's get you boxing. And, and the mentors in Camden are basically using different things like boxing or dancing to, to save kids from the streets. Uh, Chris, Chris has started this annual event, this boxing tournament in the streets of Camden. There was one last year and there was one this year. Now, this is last year's tournament. This kid, his, his, his boxing name is Showtime. He's Showtime Crespo. And um, this is the shot from last year. By this year, his father had been murdered. And this is the shot that I took of him this year. Um, this is Brian Morton, uh, who started like a little league in North Camden. I do occasionally shoot color in Camden <laughs> once in a while. But uh, this is a, you know, the things that people take for granted uh, in their towns. Like this is just a crappy fair that you, know, that, that you see all over the place. It was the first time a fair had been in Camden in like 50 years or something. So it, it, you know, it's crazy how these things take on significance. Uh, and this is, um, you know, Turn, turn the corner and there they are. You know, this is like a couple months ago. Uh, we did do a story on, this is a, another thing that they never, it, Miss, Cam, Miss Camden teen pageant. You know, which is they hadn't had a pageant there since the late 60s. So I, I was totally loved it. This is the woman, this is cleaning up afterwards. I mean, I took this picture probably one in the morning because sometimes if you stay and you stay, you'll get this, you know, this amazing moment, well, for me anyway, you know, she's cleaning the floor and, and her, she's got these wings on that are falling off. There's another story I did in Camden this year. I, um, Camden has a drill team. You might have heard of them because they've been like on NBC and ABC. They were on Dancing with the Stars, but they're called the Camden Sophisticated Sisters. And I thought, well, you know, okay, it's a drill team. How exciting could that be? I guess I'll stop in and see. Um, Tawanda Jones runs it. And she's been doing it since she was a teenager. So she's been doing this for over 20 years. And she's had like 4,000 kids go through. And she gets them all to graduate high school. And I loved them. I actually wound up following them to Hollywood to go on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> Just because to me, and my one editor is saying, and, and the, the paper didn't pay for me to go. All right, so one of the things that I do when I'm really interested in something is I just go anyway. And then when I come back, I'll sell it. You know? um, and, and, and I actually sold these pictures a few places. And I went on my own and I, oh, hang on. I, um, I save frequent flyer miles. Every, every dollar I spend on anything, I get a frequent flyer mile so that I can, you know, <laughs> do this when something comes up. I, and I guess, you know, with Camden, you keep coming back to, the violence in Camden the same way, the same way that, that I did in Philadelphia. This is at the end of the year. Uh, this is a scroll of the names of everyone who was killed in 2011. And, and on, on, 
um, the last couple days of the year, they ring a bell every hour and light a candle for everyone on the list. This is a, a funeral for a 17-year-old who was killed. Pa he was gay, and I think his friends thought that maybe made him a target. Uh, I went to a gun, a gun collection. I also, I, I, I've stayed with some families in Camden. This is a, this is a per particularly horrific. This little kid um, had his throat cut, was killed by um, a neighbor who was high on um, PCP. The neighbor like came into the house. Uh, the mother, the mother wasn't there. Uh, and maybe the door had been unlocked, I don't know. But anyway, he, he started to rape uh, the 12-year-old sister. And this little boy came down to try to defend her. And that gave the sister time to run, run out the door and get help. But this kid was killed, Dominic Andahar. And uh, this is like, you know, the, the next night on his doorstep. That's, that's the guy who did it, who had no history of violent crime. And that's, that's Amber. She's, she's the girl that, you know, she's the sister. And she's looking at pictures, uh, pictures of her brother on, on the computer. I think her family was feeling like, like it, was, it was sort of good for her to, to be able to get it out. I, I went to, they had a birthday party for her. The day that this happened was actually her birthday. So... <laughs> So getting raped and stabbed and you're losing your little brother on your birthday. So a couple of months later, they had a cake. They had a birthday party. And they put her and her brother on a cake together, which I wasn't sure was the best thing. She was starting to sort of show signs of, you know, of being herself again. But this year, um, and you can see, with, it's hard to see in this picture, and I haven't gone up to Amber and stuck my camera in her face to show. She's got all these marks around her neck where the guy cut her throat. Um, but but they, they did a march in, in Dominic's honor on, you know, on her birthday this year. And they got her a cake with just her picture on it, which I thought was like a better, a better idea. You're sort of giving her back her birthday. Did you kind say of? anything? Like, did, you, did you mention how you felt about the first cake? No. No, no, and I, you know, you, who knows either what's the best way. I mean, it's like horrific yeah, stuff. Absolutely. It's just incredible. Oh my God, you know. Uh, in 2011, they they did something in Camden uh, where no, actually 2012 they did it. They they put up crosses for everyone that was killed across from City Hall so that people would have to see it, you know. And the politicians hated it. It's like this field of crosses, but for a journalist. For like me, it was a really good way of, of meeting people and, you know, and, and, you know, and doing more stories. OK, this is, uh, this is for, actually, I talked to him this morning. <laughs> Something happened with the story this morning. This is a story I've been working on for like a year and a half. And the reporter that I'm working with on this story left the paper, and now she's working for Governor Christie. So I, I, <laughs> she says she's still going to write it. The paper says it's still OK for her to write it, but I keep calling her and telling her what's going on. But um, I had done so many stories on victims, people who were, you know. I hadn't done anything on offenders. So this guy, Phil, um, has taken care. He's raising these children. He used to be their babysitter. He and his wife, his wife died. He also raised their mother because in this family, three generations of mothers are in jail. Okay? Great grandma's a lifer in California. I'm not going to go out there and meet her because she's been there since the late 70s. Uh, grandma's at the Jersey State Prison in Clinton on drug charges. And these children's mother stabbed and killed someone at a party. They were fighting over the, the baby daddy. And, um, and so she's now in the, in the state prison also. So, so this is Phil, who called me this morning because last night, the two, the, uh, the two little boys on either side, their father was shot five times last night in Camden. And uh, he wanted me to try to use my contacts to find out if the guy was still alive. So anyway, um, this started as just a story on, just a story, a story about, about um, mothers who were in jail 
you know, being able to visit with their kids. And then when we found this one family, I said to the writer, I said, oh my God, like these are the people. We just have to stay with this family. They're, this is incredible. So anyway, we went, we went with them. And this is, a, this is the one sister who's not in jail. And she takes the kids on a van to go to the state prison to see their grandmother. And Phil's not allowed to go because it's a women's prison and only women are allowed on the van. It's weird. So I went to the jail with them and this is, this is their grandma, Tammy. And uh, they had the, the gym. They had sort of a gym set up, I think, for, for visits. It was, it was actually kind of nice. And, and, you know, this is her daughter who's not in jail, kind of looking at her mom like, really? You, you know, you're going to get it together? When are you going to get it together? Because <laughs> the mom is, is coming out in the next couple months, or the grandma of those children. But, you know, I think I, I felt like during the, watching the visit, you know, Tammy at the left, she sort of breaks the girl down and gets her on her side and, you know, wins her over by the end of the visit. Um, Phil was able to take the kids to see their mother. Now this is Phil with the kids at home. <laughs> Phil's like really too old to do this. <laughs> I've been over there when Phil's like falling asleep on the couch, you know, the kids are like doing all kinds of wild things. Um, this is at the, uh, the, the county jail in Camden where she was for a while before her trial. Question. Yes. I know as a photojournalist taking pictures in public, you don't need anything in the way of releases. But you mentioned in some cases you weren't paid, so you sold some shots. Remind us of when you would ever need a model release. Oh, well, well, obviously release would like on these prisoners, you know. Um, it's probably always a good thing to have releases. I, I haven't sold any of these things for commercial use. You know what I mean? So it's not really a, a, a case where, no, right. no. Right. If, if you do, if you do an advertisement, I, the, the limousine with the bridal couple, the, the bride and groom, that was, that was uh, sold, I think, for, as an ad. Yeah, even an ad, you do. But yeah, you yeah. Exhibit, you can sell copies of prints and stuff. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, so they're visiting their mom. And I mean, it's really hard for Phil because he's got to take the kids on the bus. And it's just... <laughs> It's just really hard. This is Christmas morning I went over there. <laughs> they really had a lot of stuff. And then, and then, you know, because it's New Jersey and there's cameras in the courtroom, I was able to go to Ebony's sentencing. And this is the family on the right of the girl, of the girl that Ebony killed. And the family of the girl, the girl that was killed. Um, Ebony's sister Essence, that you saw in some of the other pictures, had a baby right before she gave birth. The baby's father, who she really was in love with, uh, was murdered because it's Camden. So this stuff is just. So this is her new baby. And Phil said, Phil said, if, that's a, if that baby's a boy, I'm not going to help raise it. I'm only going to help raise it if it's a girl. <laughs> it was a girl. Anyway, it took months and months uh, to get to get the uh, state prison to let me back in one more time to photograph both of the women, the grandmother and the mother, being visited by the kids. And it just happened a few weeks ago, and it's like, yes, you know. But this, but this is she. This is her learning that her that her her mom is getting out uh, is getting out really soon. And and I just I, I heard her scream, and I turned around and I made that frame. And, and it, you know, and this is me stepping back and trying to show a sense of space. Because at this point, we're not in that gym anymore that was sort of ch child friendly. We're in the maximum security unit. And that's why it took me so long to get in here. Um, you know, and this, this, is, this is where the visit is. And it's, it's pretty antiseptic. And this is the two of them. So, I... I don't know at this point if I'm trying to get this in the paper like now or, you know, when Phil called me this morning to tell me about the other guy being killed, I said, well, he said, yeah, and Tammy's getting out, you know, um, in a few weeks. And I'm like, oh, geez, maybe I should wait till Tammy's out. You know, I don't know. Um, okay, so I, now I'm going to show you guys some uh, stories I've been working on for 30 years. You have to be pretty old to do this. 
<laughs> no, but um, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't kept in touch with everybody I photographed by any means. But a lot of the people I photographed, I really got to like them a lot, and I did keep in touch. And um, not necessarily continuously. This is a this is a pregnant teenager a story I did on a pregnant teenager for the Baltimore Sun, right in 1980. They, they made me promise that I would stay with the story for a year because they had a very good record of people not getting pregnant again, you know, um, once they went through the program. So I'm following Velva and, and Ricky. She's 17. These pictures are going to kind of look old because these are from the early, early 80s. And that's with her baby Siobhan and Ricky with the baby. the prom and she graduated from high school now I was about to do the story and she told me she was pregnant again and I was like oh no god you know what what do you do um you know do do you should I say that do I have to say that it's like well yeah I really should say that I mean it was birth control failure I don't you know she, she wasn't trying to to get pregnant again but you know I learned a lot about readers doing this story because I said that she was pregnant again but I felt that I had given enough a context to the story that people were not going to think she was a horrible person but you know especially now maybe more more than in the 1980s everybody is always looking in our country to have their own beliefs reinforced you know Republicans watch Fox News the Democrats are watching you know MSNBC you know so people will will look for what would support what they were already thinking. So the Baltimore Sun got tons of horrible emails about, about Velva and Ricky and you know, how irresponsible they were and, and they're gonna be on welfare forever. And you know, and I, I felt so bad, you know. Anyway, so I, a, a long period of time followed that I, I didn't see them. And then I decided um, in, it was probably like 1990 or so, I decided I wanted to start, you know, revisiting people, 1990, 95, something, uh, visiting people that, that I, had, I had met, you know, and done stories on. And I thought, well, I'll look, I'll look them up. And of course, like she had only, they'd only ever had these two kids. They never got married because um, I, she didn't get along with his mom. But I mean, he lived around the corner. He was always working a ton of jobs. I mean, they were very responsible. Nobody was on welfare. I mean, none, none of those things that the readers, you know, had, had, you know, predicted had come to pass. So this is the, you know, this is um, her. This is a little girl graduating, Siobhan. And this is Velva and Ricky. And Siobhan, you know, going to the prom. And these, these stories, I'm not doing these for anybody at this point. I mean, you know, I'm just doing them because I, I believe in doing this and, and, I, and I'm interested in it and, you know. And um, this is the second daughter, Denisha. So there was Siobhan and Denisha. This is a, a, like a Hawaiian-themed birthday party. Now, <laughs> so I, Denisha, Siobhan, like, or Siobhan graduated from high school. Siobhan still hasn't had any kids. Siobhan was like breaking the cycle. She was sort of the poster child for like not doing it again. So I thought, well, this is great. I should do a story. I should show how, you know, how they came through this and, and you know, and here the second generation isn't going to do the same thing. And then the other daughter, Denisha, got pregnant. And she had like three kids, like really fast, really young. And, um, I was like, oh no, this is terrible. Like this is, you know, this isn't what I, what I wanted to happen. You know, well, what kind of story do I have now? Well, I have two children. So I know that like, I know from experience that like you can raise them the same way. They're not gonna come out the same, you know? So, I, so to me, I, I think I have learned, especially through this project, that you know, life is not black and white. It's very gray and to appreciate that gray because you know, that's really the way it is. There's not an absolutes. They were so mad at her for having these kids. They were just like, her parents were just like, oh, I can't believe you did this. Like what, you know, and then again, she has another one and they were just, you know, this is, 
one of my favorite pictures. It's grainy as anything, but it's <laughs> Ricky had the flu, and Denisha, the, the wild daughter, um, had come over uh, to show him her prom outfit. And, and he's going, are you kidding me? Like, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously. You know, I mean, he was so mad at her. And, and this is Velma. So I was there for the births of all of her grandchildren. Velma's grandchildren. And this one, I, I remember vividly because I thought, oh my god, I'm going to get fired from my newspaper. Because I was on my way. Tom Brokaw was retiring. I was driving up to New York City to photograph Tom Brokaw at NBC for my paper. And I got this call from Velma that Denise is in labor. And I called my photo editor. I said, um, I have to go to Baltimore and photograph a baby being born. I'm really sorry. I can't do Tom Brokaw. <laughs> And he's like, are you serious? Like, what, you know, the, oh, he got so mad. I would, I, today if I tried that, I, I probably would be fired. But, um, but anyway, he uh, found somebody else to shoot Tom Brokaw. And I, and I made it in time. But I was already like, you know, I was already in Central Jersey in my car. And, you know, but my, I, I'm pretty dedicated to this, so. Uh, Velva had like a, a series of mini strokes. She was she became diabetic when she was pregnant way back, and um, her health wasn't very good. She embraced the church, and then she had like just terrible complications with her heart and almost died, and really hasn't been the same since. And it was really sad because she went from like helping raise her grandkids. You know, and this is Velva and Ricky and the two girls, and this is last year. And this is Velva and Ricky. Uh, Ricky is, um, Ricky's been married a couple of times. He's got a different girlfriend now. I, they're not together, but. But they, you know, they're still great friends. And. Happy 50th birthday, Velva, our little old lady, we love you. I mean, this is, how old does that make me? <laughs> I don't know that there's a moral to this story. I don't know that there's, you know, a, 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 this is at Velva's birthday. But, but for me, you know, it's, it's fascinating following, following people uh, like through a generation and, and seeing what happens to them. No, and, and, and actually, um, I'm going to show you two more of these. And the, maybe the moral of this is that bad things happen to you if April takes your picture. Because, <laughs> you know, this is velvet, obviously, you know, to have all these medical problems so young is, is, is really sad. Uh, this is a, a, a Cambodian refugee named Mao Soom. And I met her at the airport. It was for an assignment on, uh, it's a quick assignment, you know, uh, refugees are coming in, unaccompanied minors. And uh, let's take, take a couple of pictures, write a little story. But I was totally fascinated. I, I, I fell in love with her face. I, I just, you know, and I wanted to follow her. And Velva, uh, Velva um, Mao, Mao told me later that uh, if she had been able to speak English, she would have told me to get lost. But because she couldn't really communicate well with me, that really helped me, <laughs> you know, follow her around, kind of protection. This is the first meal they had in America. It's like, yeah. Ugh. I, I tried to show different things that, uh, like, what, what is it like being a refugee? You know, I think when I work on these long-term stories, sometimes you try to pick your moments. Like, going to the doctor is going to be scary. Meeting your foster family is going to be really weird. Because <laughs> these guys are like, OK, we'll take her in and live with us. And everyone thought that her family had been killed in Cambodia. Um, and that was sort of what, what people thought. She'd been separated from them when the Khmer Rouge came in. So people thought she, she didn't have a family at all. So she got a foster family, and she got two sisters, one of whom was very skeptical of her, at least initially. These pictures are from the 1980s. Uh, high school was really hard in the beginning. Um, I really impose on people terribly in my job. I mean, hey guys, it's going to snow tomorrow, and I know she's never seen snow before. Could I stay overnight at your house so I could be there in the morning? You're kind of far away from my house, you know. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I, I really, it, it, you, 
you re really appreciate that people allow you to, to do these things for them, with them. I shouldn't say for them. It's not, you know. Uh, she had a part-time job working at a uh, rest stop. And lost track of her for quite a while. And then, like I said, when I got this bug to go back and revisit people, she was about to become a citizen, and she was pregnant with her second child. She was married. She had her, her first child was biracial, and uh, this is her husband, and this is her baby. I was there for births of a couple of her children, too. Um, Mal thought it, it turned out that her family in Cambodia was actually alive, and she had siblings that um, she hadn't even met. So she brought one of her sisters over to help her, uh, oh, help her here for when she had her baby, and it, it went very badly. You know, and I think, I think at this point, Mao was sort of thinking, she was idealizing, you know, um, her birth family, or, or trying to a little bit, you know, because she was, she was kind of frustrated with her foster family. Yeah, you know. So Mao always told me that if she went back to Cambodia, I could come with her. And so we went back to, to visit her, her birth family in this really crappy, very, very poor village where they lived. And it was at that time that Mao finally came clean with me about how she had been separated from her family. They gave her away, they sold her to another family to be a maid when she was five years old because they thought she was ugly because her skin was so dark. So that was sort of this whole big truth that was revealed to me, you know, around this time. So it was a very bittersweet thing going back to visit them. I think she kind of wanted to show her mother and father, hey, look, you made a mistake giving me away. Look how well I've done. I'm married now. I went to college. I'm, you know, I'm American. So she came back and she, she, she handed out money and, and clothes. Here she's giving people, you know, money. And, and this is another sister that, you know, and that's her mother at the left. And it was a very empty experience for her. And she said to me, April, I feel like an orphan all over again. So it, it was really, I, I think it really made her appreciate her, her, her American family. We came back, and this is, this is her child's birthday. And um, she, was, she was nursing one of her babies. And there was some kind of a lump. And the doctor told her, oh, no, it's probably, you know, it's probably just from nursing and it's nothing. And it wasn't. She called me and she said, hey, I have breast cancer. You want to, you know, you, you want to photograph me dying? And I said, no, come on, you're not going to die. Um, but of course, sure, I'll come on over. So, um, so I, I just, I followed her with this too at her invitation. And that's her first chemotherapy appointment. And we went wig shopping together. Uh, she threw up on the rose bushes outside the house while we were looking in the phone book t for wig stores. But you know, I hadn't intended on doing a story about someone with breast cancer, it, but it was Mao, and so I wanted to stay with her. Um, another thing that I did at that time was I made a whole bunch of videotapes of her uh, for her children in case she did die, because they wanted, they wanted that for, for memory. The woman in the middle is the little girl who was in the car looking at her funny and eating noodles with her, you know. Um, Mao had been estranged from her first, her oldest daughter, and, and this is grandma is trying to get them to reconcile. Because if Mao dies, she feels like, you know, the girl will always regret. And uh, one of the days that she felt good enough, uh, put on this, uh, this wedding gown, because she was going to renew her vows. And I was there when she died. And they used my pictures at her funeral. I can't tell you how many times my pictures have been posted at people's funerals and laid all around, but I really miss her. All right. So. Um, this is, this is another story that I started to do for the Inquirer in the early 1980s on a family that adopts handicapped kids in, um, in New Jersey, actually just a few miles from my house. And this is one of those situations where 
it was actually hard to start taking pictures because the mother would say, it's not a good day. Things are too crazy. <laughs> you know, and finally, I, I kind of like, had to be really like, pushy. And I had to just say, oh, come on. It's never going to be a good day. Let me just come over. You know, I'll tell people my house is messier than theirs because it usually is true. You know. And uh, these are the Barkers. This is Diana Barker and, and um, her children. And there were some of the kids that I got closer to than others. Erica, uh, I got really close to. Uh, she was seven years old. She was about to be uh, formally adopted. She's almost a quadriplegic. That's the adoption hearing. And that's how comfortable uh, Diana got with me being around, that she would fall asleep fall asleep in my presence while I'm shooting. <laughs> That's a good sign. <laughs> it's like, OK. <laughs> they, yeah, yeah, they're fine with me now. Um, and then, then we go back again. And this is Erica, grown up now, showing me a raunchy birthday card and moving <laughs> into her own apartment for the first time. She was so excited. And she's amazing. Uh, this is a family wedding. Um, their favorite spot, Richard and Diana, their favorite spot was on an island in New Hampshire. Where they would take vacations. It's in the middle of the lake with some, and I'm not a good swimmer. I was really nervous doing that. <laughs> um, granddaughter, they actually wound up raising some of their grandkids. And they formally adopted uh, this grandchild. Diana and Richard adopted kids in an era in which I think the prevailing uh, school of thought was that like nurture was more important than nature, and and you really it was really what you did with the child, you know, I, and and not not genetics and not you know, and that I think we know now that that's that's not the whole picture at all, you know, and and. It was, it was very difficult, you know, because some of the kids were older and they had been abused uh, when they were taken in. And um, some of the kids had parents who, who were mentally ill and inherited, you know, that genetic. So it was hard. I mean, um, Diana told me at one point, you know, if I had known, um, if I had, if I had known how, how much genetics were a part of this, you know, maybe I wouldn't have done this. I mean, it, it, was, it was really tough. Anyway. Um, this is a grandchild they were raising named Ashley. And they decided, Diana believed in open adoption, and she decided that um, she would call Ashley's birth father. Ashley's mother was mentally ill and, and living you know, someplace far away. And she would call Ashley's birth father and invite him to be a part of the, come to the proceedings and be a part of Ashley's life. Okay. So this is Ashley waiting to meet her father for the first time. And, um, and this is Diana sort of trying to keep up with the demands of the kids. This is, this is one of the, the uh, last kids she adopted, William, who had spina bifida and was in the hospital a lot, almost died. And it was getting very hard, I think, because when they adopted these children, um, I don't think they were thinking that they were going to still be raising grandkids. I don't think, you know, and that they were going to be older and it was going to be exhausting. And this is, Ash, this is two grandchildren, Ashley and Justin. And that's Jeff, the guy, the birth father of, of Ashley that you saw her waiting to meet. I'm sorry, I apologize if my stories are hard to follow. It's like a cast of thousands in some of these <laughs> stories. But, um, but anyway, Justin had a bike accident. But Jeff, Jeff actually became um, a part of the household. Diana moved him into the household, I think, because she really wanted to reclaim a lot of her life. She really needed the help. She wasn't maybe being honest about, you know, the way Jeff was. I mean, Jeff, you know, people were noticing that Jeff would get really angry. And Jeff, you know, I, he maybe wasn't the best person to have living in your house, you know. But I, but I think for her, it, it, was, it was a way of, of getting some time off, you know, and reducing her burden. So, so Jeff killed her. So they had, they had a fight. Um, they were fighting. And I think she was probably um, telling him he couldn't stay at the house anymore. And, um, and, and he beat her to death, and she died. And um, 
You okay, Lola? I'm sorry. Another one of Diana's friends is here. We're, and I was very close to her when, um, when she died. So that was, it was really, I, I don't know. It was, it, was, it was just awful, you know? Uh, the, day that, the day that she was killed, I was going, um, I, I was going from one assignment to another, and, um, and I got a call tell me this had happened. And you know, y y you go into this weird place in your head. I called my assignment editor and I said, okay, so um, you know, this really close friend of mine, Diana, and so she's, she just got murdered, but don't tell anybody because I don't know if the media knows yet, and I'll go do my other assignment and then I'll go over there, okay? You know, because you're just like, you know. And, and, um, and I got there and I really, as I pulled up, there was like a TV camera and one of uh, Diana's kids was on the sidewalk, like just crying and the cameraman, you know, and, and I just sort of pulled over and, and I just sort of grabbed her and we went to a neighbor's, you know, and what I did that day was basically I, um, I was the liaison between the other media and the family for the rest of the day. Like, you know, I would come out and talk to and uh, talk to the TV guys and I would go back and say, channel three would like to talk to so-and-so, channel six this, this, this. You know, and I sort of tried to do that. Um, uh, her, it was her birth father that did this. And he, after he killed Diana, he grabbed Ashley and he took her to his girlfriend's house. And this was the moment that Ashley came back in a police car and found out that Diana was gone. So I, I didn't, it, you know, I didn't make many pictures of people grieving that day, but I did take Ashley's picture because I, I really don't think she was even like aware of of my presence, really. And this is the funeral. And um, we're outside of the, um, the Hall of Justice, the sentencing. They actually used my pictures, um, my pictures in sentencing, you know, uh, which hadn't happened before, you know, to kind of show, you know, the impact and, and the kind of person she was and everyone that depended on her. Um, and, and Richard, who had Parkinson's and was doing, like, really badly, kind of rallied and, and got, got much stronger for, for like a year or two after she died. This is Justin. He's, a lot of the kids have Diana's name tattooed on them. That's his RIP, Diana. Um, that's Ashley. I took her to the Nutcracker. She, she loved dance and she was always in the show and Diana was usually there with her, was always there with her. So I signed up to do the parent thing for her. Um, and then they had a series of people coming into the house and sort of trying to replace Diana and, and help finish raising the kids. But it was really hard. This is, Ashley did graduate from high school. This is Tony uh, when he was a kid. And, and this is Tony getting married. He hits Spina Bifida and he married a little person. And I, I love them and I love to photograph them. They're, they're, just, they're just so much fun. This is their wedding. Um, this is Richard wanted to go to the place in New Hampshire that they loved. He wanted to go because like, he thought he would probably only be able to go one more time because he was you know, really getting frail. And when he, when he like, dove into the lake, everybody was like, oh my god, like, is he kidding? Will he be able to make it out of the water? There was this whole, you know. Um, and then they found out besides Parkinson's, he had cancer. And you know, Richard said to me, he called me, and he said, April, this is it. You're gonna be there, you're gonna bring your cameras? I'm, you know, we're, I'm gonna die now. He was like, we're gonna do this. And I was like, okay. You know, I mean, it was, it was sort of like, I was supposed to be there. One of the things that, that I noticed with the kids was that like, they would go back and search for their birth families now. You know, like having lost both of their adoptive parents. And no matter how, you know, their birth parents may have, you know, given them up or, or maybe not treated them like they should have, um, I think that that was a source of comfort. This is Erica's birth mother. Uh, the family really, after Richard died, uh, the family went, in, there was this whole warfare thing going on with the family. The kids just... In their grief, the kids just started fighting terribly. This is William. This is a friend of his. He's got like this weird kind of gun in his belt, and they're fighting over the house now. And, and it, it was awful. And this is Ashley. 
and Nisa, another kid in the family, and, and they're sort of saying goodbye to the house. And I continue to follow the kids. This is uh, Nisa and her boyfriend. Nisa had a baby. She's a, she's a, great, a great kid. <laughs> and this is Tony and Bajena. She got pregnant. <laughs> and that was so much fun <laughs> for me. I mean, you know, she's, she's a little person. She's pregnant. She's got a chihuahua. You know, it's, <laughs> so, it, you know, it's just. It's photo fun, and, 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 I, and I really and I, I have a lot of affection for them. I think this is the last story. Do you want me to guys show one, one more story? I mean, I think we have, we have time. OK, yeah, you know this story. OK. This story, uh, yeah, maybe I could get some advice on like where, where to sell this story, because I'm, 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 I'm trying to get this story published. And um, anyway, so this is Renee Ramsey. Uh, well, Renee was Richard Ramsey uh, when, when he was born. But um, it's a story about, about uh, possibly the oldest person to ever change genders because uh, I think he was 77 years old and became a woman. Career military man, knew from the age of four that he was, that you know, he really should have been female. He felt it. At, at four years old, and it, and his parents wouldn't listen to him, and it just it just upset them, and um, so he went into the military to show his father what a, what a man he really was, and I met him. Uh, it was a freelancer was doing a story on him for the Enquirer, so I see this assignment, and I was oh my god, you know you see an assignment in the queue, and and you put your name on it. Interested? I'm interested. You know, and you type it in, and you know, and nobody really fought me for it at all, you know. So. Um, so I, I go and I and I, and I meet I meet uh, Richard who has become Renee, and, um, I, and to me it was just fascinating. So the Enquirer runs the one story and they run like they ran this picture, this that's it that's all they do. So I'm like, oh guys, I'm gonna keep following this person because this is really interesting. Yeah, <laughs> and and you know, but to me, okay, because because this this is going on. This is the same person. This is like could be the same week. I mean, literally, Renee had a foot in each world. As a military person, I mean, she really, you know, she did not want to out herself to her buddies. And, and she didn't want to give up, like, the VFW functions, the American Legion, all the events that were this huge part of her, of her life. Um, so, you know, I, I remember the day that I'm taking this picture. At one point, she leans over to me and she said, "You should see the lingerie I've got on under here. It's great. It's great." <laughs> you know. So I mean, <laughs> I you know, and, and I, I look at Renee as and, and and Renee. We talk a couple times a week on the phone, and and Renee is like one of those people that I would never know if I didn't have this kind of job. And and it makes my life richer for knowing for knowing someone like Renee. Anyway, so. One of the things that Renee does, uh, this, is, this is about four years ago, okay, I met Renee. So this has been going on for four years that I've been photographing Renee. The Inquirer ran one story and um, published the story. And then a few days later, I, I'm on AOL because I'm a dinosaur. I still use AOL. And, and on the homepage, it says, like, military vet becomes woman. And I'm like, wow, there's somebody else like Renee on the AOL homepage. And of course, it's Renee. It's, you know, the story went out over the wire, and, and there's a thousand nasty comments. I counted them. I printed them out for some reason. There are like a, a thousand people just ripping into, you know, and, and then there's people calling the newspaper, like the National Enquirer and the Tyra Banks Show and like everybody in the world. And thank God Renee was unlisted, you know, because she wasn't really ready for, you know, for that kind of attention, you know. So I, I told Renee, I said, I'm going to, I'm just going to stay with this. And you know, whenever we feel comfortable, we'll maybe we'll put another story out there. But you know, don't don't worry. So um, the woman at the right, uh, Lady Ellen, Lady Ellen, she calls herself, and she is um, she's a secretary, a college secretary, who who be started her own business, left uh, left the college where she worked, and she started something called um, Lady Ellen's Fem Finishing School. And it's in Central Jersey, and basically she runs it out of her house, and and she caters to, she mostly caters to men who like to cross dress, you know, straight men who like to cross dress. But you know, there, 
there's an occasional transgender too, and she, she teaches, she's very good. She teaches them how to dress, how to walk, how to, all kinds of things. And she has events. She'll have a pageant. She'll have a thing where they'll like take over a dress barn for an hour, you know, and they'll all go shopping together. So, so I spent some time at Lady Ellen's. When Renee would go, I would go along. The thing, yeah, Renee, Renee, all these feminine things that like suddenly she could do. No, she's not even getting her ear pierced. She's getting a clip-on earring put on her lobe. But it's like, well, you know, it's a new thing. It's like, ah, you know. Uh, she would save like her her you know pension, and and she would get all these procedures done to look more female. Like she had a lot of scars. She was tough. She was in the army, navy. I mean, I think she was a green beret. I mean, she was like she was tough. Tattoos, you know. But she had you know scars from the war and wounds. And so I mean, I went. I'm trying to think of how many surgeries I was there. She got a facelift. She got like uh, things done to her lips and her eyes. Just feminizing things. This is after the facelift. And the thing that I thought, you know, with Renee, with this in between two worlds stuff, I thought, at what point is she going to like give up on this? Because she would, she started getting really annoyed with going to the, the military events and saying like, you know, I hate this. I don't want to put on that uniform one more time. I can't, can't do it anymore. Um, after she got these thir 38 D's, I think she got. After the 38 Ds, I thought, the uniform's not going to fit anymore. And that's going to be, that's the way she's going to get out of it. So I said, can I be at your house the first time you put on your uniform? And this is like, this is like pretty far from where I live. You know, and she's like, sure. You know, so, because I, I felt like that that would be, that'd be a turning point. Um, this is, she, she decided she wanted to get, out, it was very lonely. Her, her as as she started dressing like a woman, um, her her army buddy, the guy that she was the closest to, said, "I I, I can't be around you if you're going to dress like that." Period. So that was it. So she kind of lost her her best buddy there, and she she got increasingly lonely. So she um, she made a, she made friends on the internet with um, with a younger person, like 50 years old. Um, some, somebody who I, I, is like, you know, pre-op, but dresses like a woman. And, you know, and be, they became roommates. She moved to South Carolina. And this is her waiting to move. This is her place in New Jersey. And, and this, is, this, is, this is Renee, and Miranda's helping her move. Miranda Wrights is the name of the person she lives with, Miranda Wrights, which is a great, great name to give yourself, I think. Um, and, this picture on the wall on the right, um, I said, Renee, aren't you going to take your pictures? And she said, no, I don't, you know, that really wasn't who I was supposed to be. So I took that one home. That's, it's, you know, I took some of Renee's old, I took an old dresser that, um, that Renee uh, didn't, didn't want or couldn't take with her, and, and the dresser's sitting there, and that picture's on top of it. So I, I guess. This is the ending for my story. This is the neighbors watching as they as Renee's packing up. So um, that's my show. So we should talk. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.